Hey guys, welcome back to Orms TV and welcome to our first video from a very locked down South Africa. Yes, the South African government, like many other governments around the world, has instituted a 21 day lockdown period. And that is of course to curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Now, whilst myself, Andre and Jess is in our own homes practicing self-isolation, we will still be bringing you guys the content that you have come to expect. And to kick that off, today's video is going to be a Q&A. Now, a while back, we put out a call on all of our social media channels for you guys to send us any questions that you might have, be it gear related or related to activities that we are going to be doing in future. And today we're going to answer those questions and we're going to kick it off with a whole bunch of questions that we got about the Canon 90D. Before I get into my first question, let me just apologize up front if I butcher anybody's names. A lot of our questions came from viewers from all over the world and I'm going to try my best, but please forgive me. Don't be too harsh in the comments if I get any of your names wrong. Now, my first question comes from Schwarnadip and he would like to know if the 90D has dual pixel autofocus when you are recording in 4K video. And that's a simple one. Yes, yes, it absolutely does. Canon's beautiful dual pixel autofocus is available when you're shooting 4K video or when you're shooting full HD. The only mode where it is not available is if you are shooting in the ultra high frame rate full HD, but in 4K video, yes, you definitely have dual pixel autofocus. So then a question that actually a lot of people asked was in regards to the dynamic range performance of the 90D and specifically whether it was better than what you got in the 80D. Yes, the dynamic range has been slightly improved if you're shooting at lower ISOs. So if you're shooting at an ISO of 100, the dynamic range is slightly better. But where the 90D really shines compared to the 80D is if you push that ISO up and at higher ISOs, the dynamic range is a good couple of stops more than what you got on the 80D. And it's a really, really good improvement even just for that reason alone. And it's quite impressive that Canon managed to bump up the megapixel count on an APS-C size sensor, but then still maintain that beautiful dynamic range running throughout and actually improve it over the ATD. Now for our next question, MC Rob or McRob would like to know whether or not the Canon 90Ds Digital image stabilization is only available if you have a Canon IS lens on the camera. And that is a no. That digital image stabilization can be used with any one of Canon's lenses or any other manufacturer's lenses that's compatible with the Canon system. Now the downside is, is that when you do enable that digital IS, it does crop in the frame a little bit and that's true for stills and video. And that's unfortunate and that's a byproduct of the fact that this is a DSLR and they do for the most part do not have proper sensor shift image stabilizers. Now, the nice thing is, is that when you do enable that digital IS, it does smooth out your video footage and your stills as well, but it's mostly gonna be used for video. And the other thing is, is that unfortunately, it does cause a little bit of a drop in sharpness as the sensor and the processor tries to compensate for any movements that you have, essentially by moving the image around on the sensor as opposed to moving the sensor itself. Hey guys, it's Andrea from Orms TV. As you can see, I'm filming in my room, respecting the 21 day period of lockdown for the coronavirus that we've got in South Africa. So first up, let's check out on YouTube. We've got a question from Mr. Campbell saying, what should I buy for a wedding video shoot? A Sony NX2000 camcorder or a Canon 90D DSLR? So good question. And first off the bat, I would definitely say, personally, I'll definitely look at the DSLR first. The DSLR is gonna give you big advantages on the sensor side of things. The sensor is much bigger, giving you better depth of field, which will be quite crucial, I think, when shooting cinematic videography kind of stuff. And then also, obviously, the bigger sensor gives you much better low light performance. The biggest downside of using a DSLR for video is recording limit time. During speeches that might be a tricky one and also the obvious other issue is lenses. You're gonna have to have multiple lenses for various different kind of shots which will cost a lot more in the long run. Then on the camcorder side of things that you can record past 30 minutes so that might be a better tool to use for speeches but obviously a smaller sensor is going to give you quite a big limitation on your cinematic style and feel and also camcorders has got a fixed lens and generally a very standardized aperture through them. The camcorders are much more cost-effective system 
while the DSLR is going to be probably the better future proof, but a more expensive investment to get into. So sticking with the 90D, we've got a Paul Wilson asking clean HDMI out with autofocus. So as we know, the 90D will offer you 4K clean and also full HD clean via the HDMI. They do unfortunately not specifically state with autofocus. So that's maybe something that we can test for you once we're back up and running after the lockdown. Okay, now that we're done with all the questions about the 90D, we can move on to some other cameras. So SG would like to know whether or not the G5X Mark II from Canon has 120 frames per second slow-mo. Yes, it does. Um, it is only in the full HD video mode, but that is still very handy. So you can shoot at 120 frames per second. It is a baked in slow-mo. So when you play back, it plays at quarter speed, which is to be expected of a camera in that range, but it is still a nice handy feature to have. The downside is that when you do record at 120 frames per second, the footage does go a little bit soft, which is uh, a bit unfortunate considering that camera actually has a very nice one inch sensor. But yes, 120 frames per second is available. Then we've got another question from a Mr. Ramble Joe. How do you find out what your camera shutter count is? So there's actually a website online called camerashuttercount.com, which is not an official Canon, Nikon or Sony page, but uh, it is a third party company that will allow you to upload your photograph to the website and they can give you an estimate of your shutter count. But for a more official one, you can bring it into the Orm store and we can actually test it for you as well. Now the following is a question that we got on our Fujifilm GFX100 video and Helga states or asks looks like Lightroom is used question marked well no surprisingly enough not all of those images that you saw in that video that were shot with the Fujifilm GFX100 was straight out of camera JPEG and oh man that's a testament to how good that camera was I I still remember how blown away I was with that thing. At the time when we filmed that video, unfortunately Lightroom and Photoshop could not open the RAW files from that camera. And yeah, I mean, even just working with the RAWs, they're such monster files that eventually it just became a little bit too cumbersome and we just used straight from camera JPEGs and oh, they looked phenomenal. That, that camera is a beast, I'll just say it again. That thing is absolutely monstrous. All right, our next question is regarding the Canon G5X Mark II and it is from the Bella Texan and he's asking if the camera overheats after recording 10 minutes in 4K. Remember the Canon G5X Mark II is a photo based model. It was never aimed at the video shooter. Yes, it does have 4K capabilities, but Canon has limited that to 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, the camera will shut off and you'll have to start again. Now this might be uh, due to overheating, but I think the main reason is Canon will then force you to either look at the G7X Mark III or maybe go higher up and maybe go to their DSLRs or mirrorless. So if you need 4K capabilities, but you need maximum recording lengths, maybe even consider going to another brand like Sony RX100, or like I said, go mirrorless or DSLR. Then sticking on the 5X, we've got a question from Pedro asking if a USB-C cable to microphone adapter will give you a mic input onto the camera and no unfortunately not it will not it will allow you however to transfer images via the USB-C and also to charge the camera via a power bank that is the only use of the USB fitting in the camera now I have a question here from George and George man I love you but what a question I eh? um Sony or Canon for video well no matter how I answer this someone's going to be upset. There is no right or wrong answer there. It's, um, it's, it's going to be 100% a personal preference thing. What I will say though, is that if it comes to using a DSLR or a mirrorless camera for video, right now, as things stand in terms of what you can actually go out and buy in the market and shoot video with, Sony does have a bit of the upper hand with their mirrorless lineup of cameras. Now saying that, that, um, as we know, Canon announced the EOS R5 and man, with 8K video and all the other promised features in that thing, when that thing comes out, it might tip that balance a bit. But at the same time, Sony has the A7S Mark III on the horizon. So I kind of think that that's very, very, very close between those two guys. And 
you know, Canon and Sony, they're gonna keep going at it. They are the two biggest players in that specific video field. When it comes to actual video cameras though, and cine cameras, it's, 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 it's really, really up to what you want out of it. Now our next question here is from Caleb and Caleb says that he is a budding young photographer and that somewhere in the next year he wants to pop down to Cape Town and visit Orms. Caleb, when you come down, hit us up. Now Caleb wants to get one of two lenses. He either wants to get a Canon 55-250 to or a 85mm f1.8 and would like some advice as to which one to go for. Depends on what you want to do really. Straight up I'll say that if you're going after pure quality, going for a prime lens is 99.9% .9 of the time going to be, be better than going for a lens with a variable focal range. So going for that 85 mol, you know, might just be the easier step and the better step to go for. With the 85 mol, you're going to get some beautiful portrait work out of it. It gives lovely background compression, beautiful bokeh out of it as well. And it's a great lens for the money. It's a bit of an older lens, the autofocus is a bit slower and that kind of thing, but it is still a phenomenal lens. Now the 55-250 to is an EFS lens, which is already a bit of a concern. You won't be able to upgrade it in future if you do go for full frame cameras, and it's going to limit you a little bit if you do decide to maybe switch over to Canon's mirrorless lineup, you know, going for something like an EOS RP or an R5 in future. That lens is going to cause the sensor to crop in. So just straight off the bat I would say go for the prime lens, you're gonna get that quality and you're going to get sort of bang for your buck in terms of future proofing your investment. The 55-250 to though is a very nice zoom lens and it's a very nice kit lens if I can put it that way. So basically a kit lens um, I would consider as a lens to just get you started, to get you into the game, but if you have any idea of what you actually want out of photography, stay away from them, rather get that 85 and improve your skills with a prime, that lens is quite lovely. All right, then we've got a question here from uh, our GoPro video we did from Anthony saying, what are your thoughts regarding the size of the Max versus the Hero 8? So the Max is almost double the size of the Hero 8. So for the 360 camera, that's not bad at all. And seeing that you can do high quality 360 content, um, I think it's decent for the size. I mean, there's nothing more you can say on that. Okay, now Ramesh hit us up with a question about the Sony 200 to 600. And he would like to know whether that lens is compatible with the Sony Alpha A6100. Simple answer, yes, it absolutely is compatible. The nice thing with the Sony system is that pretty much all of their lenses will work on any of their cameras even if you take a crop sensor lens and you put it onto a full frame camera the sensor itself will crop in and still allow you to use that lens which is a very very nice feature to have now specifically the 200 to 600 on a a6100 will work perfectly you will have full functionality there is absolutely zero limitations using that lens on something like the a6100 the really nice thing about using it on the a6100 is is that you apply the crop from the sensor so it's a 1.5 crop so that 200 to 600 immediately becomes a 300 to 900 millimeter lens which is that's pretty sweet that's some crazy crazy range that you're going to get out of that lens so yeah definitely compatible and should actually be a pretty good combination now we got a question from michael bartlett about the fuji xt4 and he would like to know whether the xt4 is an upgrade from the xt3 and whether it's worth upgrading from the xt3 to the xt4 should you have an X-T3. Michael, I'm gonna give you my personal opinion on this one. That's a yes and a no. Yes, the X-T4 is an upgrade on the X-T3. It adds a lot of video related features, but very, very few stills related features. And that's going to inform my answer here. If you are 100% a stills shooter and you've got an X-T3 already, then it's probably not worth upgrading to the X-T4. Now, yes, the image stabilization is a very nice to have but for the most part 
it's not really a game changer, but that really depends on how you shoot. Um, if you're very much run and gun, you know, the stabilizer could be very, very handy. If you are a bit more static in your shooting style, then the stabilizer isn't going to make that much of a difference. Now, if you're a hybrid shooter though, if you're shooting stills and video, then yes, the X-T4 is 100% an upgrade on the X-T3 and you should definitely consider it. Getting that image stabilization in body, pushing it up to 5.5 stops with um, a lot of Fuji's lenses is absolutely phenomenal and it is a great camera to look at. Where it's going to be a bigger upgrade is if you're coming from a little bit lower in Fuji's range. So if you're coming from something like an X-T20, an X-T30, maybe a Fuji um, X-T1 or an X-T100 or something like that, then an X-T4 is going to absolutely blow your mind. It's a phenomenal camera and you can't go wrong getting that unit. Then jumping to our Canon XF705, we've got Simon saying, will the mic show in your footage when using a fisheye adapter? It is quite possible if you've got a quite a long rifle mic, it might poke into your shot, but most mics designed for the XF range is quite short, like an NTG1, so in theory it shouldn't pop in your shot. Then also sticking with the XF705, We've got Joseph. Would you use this Nikon Z6, 35mm prime and an Atomos for TV recording? Two quite different cameras. I mean the XF705 is a broadcast styled camera. It's got your STI already built into it. It's got a lot of things built into it that's made for broadcast or TV use. I would probably use the XF705 in that regard. If you're doing documentaries, uh, maybe wedding videography, then the Nikon Z6 would definitely make more sense. Mike Winburn would like to know on the new 1DX Mark III whether that touch sensitive AF on button can be used to move through your autofocus points both in live view or if you're looking through the optical viewfinder. And that's a yes. It's such a nifty little feature that they put onto that camera. And it seems so small at first, but it is massive when it comes to actually using it and greatly improves the ergonomics over the previous unit. So even if you are looking through the viewfinder, you bring up your autofocus points and then you can use that little touch button to flick through them very, very quickly. And it is an incredibly handy little feature to use. When I was out shooting, with it I ended up using it a lot even if you're shooting with like a cluster of autofocus points just being able to move them around like that instead of having to use the joystick to move them one focus point at a time is a game changer and it really really is a nifty feature to have now another question related to the 1dx mark 3 but this one specifically related to our review of that camera where we went out and we shot some uh, windsurfing and a little bit of stand-up paddle boarding muhammad hussein would like to know at five minutes and 55 seconds into that video what is the lens that's on the camera at that specific moment um the camera has a Canon 70 to 200 f2.8 lens on there. We use that lens for some of the closer shots in that review. And the other lens that we used in that review was the 400 millimeter f2.8, also with a two times converter on it as well. Both of those combinations worked extremely well, especially the 400 mil 2.8. That really is the type of lens that a 1DX Mark III is made for. It just absolutely eats up anything that you put through that lens. Also, if you take the 400 2.8 and you put the two times converter on, you maintain full autofocus. That's just lovely if you're shooting anything at a great distance. So thank you for that question. All right, then we've got another question here from Matt asking, which lens has the most uses? If you are starting out, it might be a good idea to get like a versatile lens, something maybe like a 24105 or 18135, maybe even bigger, something like an 18400 maybe even. Something that covers a lot of range because generally when you're starting out you're not sure what kind of photography you're going to get into and if you cover a lot of range that kind of sets you out to cool shoot portraits shoot a bit of sport shoot a bit of wide angle 
And as soon as you get your niche, then you kind of get the right lenses for that niche. More specific and professional lenses are generally much shorter range, 24, 70, 50 mil fix, 70 to 200. So I would say get a nice versatile lens for starting out. And then once you get your niche, then sell that thing and then get something better. Jumping to the Fuji video we did on the X-T4. We've got a question here from Techverse asking, X-T4 versus A7 III, what's your thoughts? So I would really Really say it depends on what your need and application is. Both cameras is very capable of professional video and photo but I think if your real need is high-end professional video I would probably go towards the Sony system the a7 III just knowing in terms of lenses there is way more options. In terms of the camera the biggest benefit there is going to be um, crazy good autofocus crazy good stabilization and obviously the full frame. In terms of photography though if your main application is photography I would actually jump ship to Fuji. Color processing is way better. The way the Fuji shoots as a photo camera is also a lot better as well. That's more of a personal thing. But in terms of the hardware, both cameras is really going to give you a good result. Photo slash video, maybe the Fuji X-T4. If your need is more in terms of professional video, then probably the Sony a7 III. Now, Umar Hanze wants to know, is Orms going to run any photo walks in future? Yes, yes we will. But we have done photo walks in the past. It's always been in conjunction either with Fuji or Nikon or Canon or the like. But yes, we are definitely planning on running some photo walks in our own capacity. And we actually had some planned, but unfortunately COVID-19 happened and everything has been put on hold with regards to that. Keep an eye on your inbox. We will let you guys know as soon as we're back in action and photo walks are back on. It's gonna be a lot of Fun. I would love to host a photo walk, but we'll see what happens. But yes, definitely going to have photo walks run by Orms. Is it better to have two smaller flashes or one big expensive flash? And this question comes from Tristan. Yes, yes, it is better to have two smaller flashes as opposed to one larger expensive flash. The reason behind that is scope for creativity. If you have more than one flash, there is a lot more that you can do with those flash units. There's a lot more positioning that you can do. If you have them linked via radio triggers, you can be so much more creative with backlighting, halo lighting, pretty much anything. Just controlling your light in all various manners as opposed to just having one single light source. One single light source, yes, you can be creative with it, but it is always going to limit you. In every single way, it is better to have more than one smaller flash. To overcome the strength of those flashes, you can always position them closer to your subject. Yes, I know it's not always possible. I know that when you're shooting weddings and things like that, you don't always have control over how close you can be. Yeah, it is just better to have more than one option Option available to you. you. You really can do a lot more with multiple smaller flashes as opposed to that one super expensive big flash. Bernard wants to know what is the best and most cost-effective microphone? Without knowing exactly what you want to be able to shoot, what scenarios you're going to be using it in, it is very very difficult to recommend both the best and the most cost-effective microphone. What I can say though is that if you are shopping in sort of the mid to high range bracket, Looking at your Rode microphones will give you some phenomenal microphones without absolutely destroying your bank account completely. If you're looking at a little bit more cost-effective options, look at the Saramonic microphones or even Boya microphones. They really do give some amazing quality at, at very affordable price points. Right now I'm using a Saramonic lapel microphone set and yeah, the audio quality is pretty good. The options are definitely out there there. But Bernard, if you want to drop us an email, maybe add a little bit of context to your query, we can respond a little bit better. Saying that in future, we do have a microphone shootout planned. So maybe wait out for that video. That should answer a lot of your questions and we'll run through sort of some high end, some mid tier and some lower end microphones on the price point. And then of course, give you the comparison to see which one is the best value for money. So we've got a question here from Anonymous and he's asking what happened to extreme sport legend hardcore podcore? Apparently he is climbing the biggest Fuji mountain in the world at the moment and we have no ways of contacting him so it's a very small chance that we actually might never see him again. Who knows? That's it for all the questions from my side. Andre at Orms TV. I hope you guys are staying indoors and stay safe. See you guys next time.
Well guys, that wraps up our first Q&A video and also our first video in lockdown. Now, we really enjoyed making it even though we are all in separate locations. It was a lot of fun, just all the coordination and things to get this video made. Now, while we are all in lockdown, guys, please remember to stay safe. Please practice self-isolation. I know you guys want to get out there and get creative, but hey, you know, stay indoors and exercise that creativity muscles a different way. Now, if you enjoyed this content, please don't forget to subscribe. It really, really helps out this channel. And if there's anything that you would like to know, please comment down below. We love hearing from you guys and always respond to your queries. Also, drop us a comment down below if there's any specific videos that you'd like us to make while we are under lockdown. Guys, we'll see you next time. Cheers.